It's my great pleasure to introduce the presenter of the 2015 Hayek Lecture, Professor William Easterly. Each year I put out feelers asking people who might be a good Hayek Lecture 18 months later. And when I did that last year, all fingers pointed towards Bill Easterly. And his topic tonight is both timely and important. Professor Easterly is Professor of Economics at New York University and co-director of the New York University Development Research Institute, which works to bring high quality economic research to the problems of world poverty. He has previously worked for the World Bank, the Institute for International Economics, and the Center for Global Development. Bill has been listed by various magazines as one of the world's most highly cited researchers, as one of the top 100 global intellectuals, and one of the top 100 scientist stars of Twitter. He has written a number of books about foreign aid and its effects on developing countries. His most recent book, The Tyranny of Experts, was a finalist for the Manhattan Institute's Hayek Award, which he had previously won with his 2008 book, The White Man's Burden. His latest book has been described as yet another striking and original success that puts together the role of government, the failure of experts, and the best way forward into one comprehensive package. I'm sure that will be an apt description of the lecture we're about to hear. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Bill Easterly. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be with you tonight at the Hayek Memorial Lecture. Tonight, I don't think I need to convince you that there is still going on in our world today a battle of values between freedom and dictatorship. The sad thing for me as a development economist is that a lot of us who work in aid and development and I count my own past self in this, have too often unintentionally wound up on the side of the dictators. Now I say that was an accident. It was contrary to the private sympathies of most of us who work in aid and development for freedom over dictatorship. But it happened because foreign aid and development efforts often focus on technical solutions alone to the problem of poverty. And there is something about technical solutions that is very, very seductive, because it sounds very tangible that a lot of the problems of the poor could be fixed with some appealingly simple technical intervention. So suppose a group of farmers are raising food inefficiently on their land, and a forestry project could come in and deliver a lot higher value for the same land. Or suppose uh, people are suffering from malnutrition and part of that is vitamin A deficiency, which can be alleviated very cheaply and simply by vitamin A capsules. Or suppose the same people are suffering from malaria, which can be treated with a variety of technical weapons in our arsenal, including just spraying a chemical called pyrethrum on the walls of houses that kills mosquitoes. Or even clean water. It's as simple as drilling a well to the water table, a borehole. These technical solutions, they seem so straightforward and simple that there's the illusion that we can just specify the technical solutions and then they will happen and poverty will be solved. That's what we could call the technocratic illusion, that, can, that we can ignore politics, that we can ignore the, the battle of values between freedom and dictatorship. So let me tell you a story about exactly how that sort of technocratic vision can go badly wrong. This is a story that happened on February 28, 2010, in a district called Mubende, Uganda, where a group of farmers were in church when they heard gunfire outside. They came outside, and they found men with guns burning down their houses, torching their crops. The guns were going off because they were shooting their livestock. And they marched these 20,000 farmers away from their own land at gunpoint and told them the land is no longer yours, this land that had been in their families for generations. 
Why was this happening? It was actually happening because of a World Bank forestry project that had decided that a better use of this land was forestry rather than what the farmers were using it for. So you can see that a simple technical solution like forestry is not so simple after all. That we do need to talk about things like the rights of poor people. And of course, the rights of the farmers in Mubende, Uganda, were just every possible right was grossly violated on this occasion. Their property rights, their human rights, their political rights to protest against the violation of their property rights and their human rights. And the saddest thing to me about this story is that even though this story became much more publicized than almost any other rights violation in the history of development, it actually showed up on the front page of the New York Times. Maybe I'm a little provincial. I think of that as the world's leading newspaper. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it was on the front page of the New York Times a few months after these events. The World Bank was momentarily embarrassed that they had sponsored a project that dispossessed 20,000 farmers at gunpoint. They promised to do an investigation the next day. That is, they promised the next day to do an investigation. Uh, it's been almost six, six years since that happened. They never did that investigation. They never investigated their own role in that tragedy. What's even sadder to me is that nobody in the development and aid world really protested much about this at the time. There was almost like a silence, and so the World Bank really got away scot-free with a massive rights violation of poor Ugandans. Now, the next thing I need to do at this point is as an economist, I almost feel like I have to apologize for talking about an emotional issue like farmers being dispossessed at gunpoint, human rights violations. Uh, economists usually do prefer to talk in technical terms and not talk about values issues. As Hayek himself said uh, in a famous quote that economists fail to talk about the most important things going on in the world today because they insist on always wanting to give a sort of scientific gloss to what they say. So in that world, I almost feel like I'm talking about an emotional, compelling issue like human rights, like political rights, like economic rights. I feel like I'm almost confessing that I cry at the end of Hollywood romance comedies, but, um, which I actually do. But um, I want to convince you that, that this is a cause that indeed economists should take seri seriously, and indeed everyone in the aid and development world should take seriously. And why is this? It's because as economists, we cannot actually do our work without, or as development workers, we actually cannot do our work in some kind of value-free, politics-free environment. So at the most elementary level, there's a really wonky concept in economics called revealed preference, which is that if someone chose A over B, they must be better off because they had the choice and they took A over B. So that's a really extremely wonky roundabout way of saying that uh, economists think they were the ones to discover that people are only better off by something if they consented to that something. I think that was pretty obvious before economists came along. And the reverse is true also. If coercion was necessary to impose something on some Ugandan farmers, then obviously they were worse off because coercion would not have been necessary if they had been better off. And so that's the elementary underlying logic of why we cannot ignore such a simple principle as the rights of the poor to choose, to choose their own destiny, to possess their own property, to be able to protest if you violate that choice, that right to consent. And so that's why we cannot ignore politics in development work. The other thing, things that I want to get rid of here uh, are the conceptions that this argument could be perceived as self-righteous, no. Not going to go there because I myself, for most of my career, was subscribed to the technocratic illusion that I'm criticizing tonight. Embarrassingly late in coming around to the realization that it doesn't make sense. And it's also uh, the other word that's of often attached to these arguments is something partisan or ideological. And no, sorry, this is not the property of one political party or another. The concern for the rights of the poor should be universal, should be a nonpartisan, bipartisan effort in free societies that value the rights for, their, for themselves, 
We value our own rights for ourselves. We should value rights for poor people. So let me give you a little bit of illustration of where all this is coming from. This incident in Mubenda, Uganda is not an isolated incident. It actually is something that goes back into the, deep into the history of Africa, in which there are many stories in which there's some combination of a Western power involved in Africa, uh, allied with some local oppressors who violate the rights of poor Africans. So on this occasion, one reason that uh, the World Bank got away with it in Uganda is that the dictator of Uganda, Museveni, is a big ally of the US and the UK in the war on terror. And that's one reason why the World Bank giving loans to Uganda, even right, violating rights, even supporting directly a direct rights violation in its own projects is something that the World Bank could get away with. It's because of that political environment. That's another polit political reality that we cannot ignore. We should not be hypocritically criticizing dictators in Africa without looking at our own role in the US and UK in supporting and being compliant and supporting dictators because of our own foreign policy interests without valuing the rights of poor Africans that are being violated. And this actually, this history of course also goes back deep into colonial times when Western colonial powers were allied with local intermediaries who were, uh, and the Western colonial powers were themselves the oppressors, the, the autocrats violating the rights of the poor. And so it happens that in colonial times, there was also the technocratic approach to solving the problems of the poor. I want to illustrate that with a, a slide that uh, this was a slide that I got from a very long technocratic report that was actually done in 1938 on Africa by a British colonial official. Sorry to pick on Britain as the colonial power, but you know, you can, we can talk later about US sins of colonialism. Uh, a British colonial official named Lord Haley prepared a very, thousand, very long thousand page technocratic report on how to solve poverty in Africa. And the solutions that he came up with sound remarkably similar today. Uh, you remember that chemical called pyrethrum that you spray on the walls of houses to kill the mosquitoes? That was already known in 1938. The idea of vitamin A supplements to deal with malnutrition, already known in 1938. Uh, the, I'm comparing these recommendations with the same recommendations that were made in a United Nations report in 2005 that was done by some famous economists you've probably heard of. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the names. Jeff Sachs, uh, Angelina Jolie, uh, uh, Bono, uh, the world's leading aid economist. Um, um, so anyway, they were the authors of the UN report, the counterpart to Lord Haley, but except a lot better looking. And uh, they came up with the same solutions in 2005 that he had already come up with in 1938. The moral of this slide is that uh, if you thought that problems of poverty could be solved by expert solutions, by experts, there were already experts in 1938 that already knew the answers. They it didn't work then and it's not working now. The problem of poverty is not a shortage of experts, it's a shortage of rights. The problem of poverty is not a shortage of experts, it's a shortage of rights. And the reason for that is the other part of a long, very long literature in economics in which uh, rights are themselves a problem-solving mechanism that makes the technical solutions happen. It's the ability of us as free citizens in our own societies, it's the ability of poor people in their societies to hold the suppliers of their needs, both private and public, accountable that makes technical solutions happen. Technical solutions do not happen by themselves. They happen in an environment of rights in which there's economic rights in which you can choose how to use your own land for yourself or your customers. You can hold your private suppliers accountable by driving them out of business if they don't supply your needs. We can hold the public suppliers of our needs of public goods like clean water accountable if, uh, through political protest and through democratic elections. And in that rights environment, rights do indeed, not perfectly, not, not, there's never any utopia on the horizon, but, but when there's an environment of universal rights for poor people, 
for citizens of a society, then indeed that does make technical solutions happen. And in the absence of those rights, technical solutions will never permanently have the incentive to happen. So, of course, one thing technical solutions are fairly good for is that they are a convenient justification for a lot of uh, US and UK foreign policy, in which I've already mentioned that uh, justifying support for autocrats in the war on terror, it can be awfully convenient to, to do that by also saying, well, I'm, we're making development happen by supporting those autocrats in, in those poor countries. So we're making development in Uganda happen by giving aid to Museveni. So we seem to get a twofer that we get both our, our ally in the war on terror and we also got uh, development happening by giving aid to the dictator to make development happen. Well, uh, sorry to disabuse you of this being a new idea, but Lord Haley already had that idea in 1938. He offered colonial rule as an autocratic twofer also, that you get both development and, you also, and the British also get to keep their empire, which at the time they wanted to keep. Uh, he made the statement uh, that the British Empire was, quote, uh, part of the movement for the betterment of the backward peoples of the world. That language probably not be used that way today exactly, the betterment of the backward peoples of the world, but it's pretty recast in development terms, it's the same idea. Uh, he made the argument without any particular evidence that poor people did not care about their political rights. He said, quote, political li liberties are meaningless unless they can be built up on a better foundation of social and economic progress. Uh, that was a convenient justification for uh, continuing the empire, continuing colonialism. Uh, it was actually already being disproved at the time by all of the poor people in Africa who were fighting for the end of colonialism, for the end of colonial rule. So there's a, a drama that was played then that is, is often replayed now when British humanitarians at the time in 1938 asked what should we do to end poverty, which is always the big question in the field of, of global poverty. What should we do immediately now to end poverty? Uh, Lord Haley wanted to say, look at the technical solutions over here. Please ignore the political realities of colonialism over here. And he wanted to perpetrate the technocratic solutions that the technocratic solutions can be done without worrying about those messy political issues like colonialism. So he wanted the experts like me to give an answer like spray native huts with pyrethrum, give vitamin A capsules, sink boreholes. He did not want me to say, well, just end colonialism, which actually wound up happening against the will of the colonial powers. So today in the present, we're somewhat in a somewhat analogous situation. Uh, once again, let me give you one other example of an ally in the war on terror with another dictator, uh, the Ethiopian dictator Mele Sinawi. Uh, his longtime rule until he died from natural causes in 2012, he was a, a big ally of the US and the UK in the war on terror. And it was a very convenient justification that he could also be seen as a development leader that he was helping develop Ethiopia. The major aid donors to Ethiopia were, were DFID from, from the UK, the USAID, and the World Bank. And not only that, but um, uh, the Gates Foundation, who I'll, I'll get to Mr. Gates in a moment, is also a huge supporter of Ethiopia. Now, I, could get, I don't have t really time to give you too many atrocity stories in today's talk. I could give you another atrocity story in Ethiopia, which also involved forced resettlement financed by the USAID, DFID, and the World Bank, in which there was a villagization program that forced farmers in the province of Gambella at gunpoint away from their lands. It's a, basically an exact replay of the Mubende Uganda story. Despite all that, uh, once again, the technocratic illusion is to ignore these rights violations over here and concentrate on these technical solutions like those seen here on the board. And Mr. Gates is a good example of that. He praised the Ethiopian government in 2013 for, quote, setting clear goals, choosing an approach, measuring results, and then using those measurements to continually refine our approach. Gates said that this, quote, helps us to deliver tools and services to everybody who will benefit. 
Gates said that he had, quote, a great working relationship with Ethiopian autocrat Mela Sanawi, who he said has made real progress in helping the people of Ethiopia. So Gates is very much embracing the technocratic illusion here. He's embodying exactly the technocratic illusion. He seems unaware of the argument that dictators actually do not cause progress. They cause poverty. The dictators are the reason that poverty is there in the first place, following a long history of previous autocracy of colonial rule and the slave trade, and a long, unhappy history of autocracy in Africa that has already lasted too long, and that we should be supporting the end of the reign of autocracy, not its continuation with development aid. Uh, so across the decades, we have this interesting, diverse group of actors who want us to concentrate on the technocratic solutions in this table and ignore the politics. So let me, here's uh, Lord Haley. Uh, here's Bill Gates. <laughs> Looking a little clueless about dictators here. And then here's those leading economists that I was referring to before. <laughs> um, so, now at this point in the talk, I'm gonna to have to take a sip of water. So at this point in the talk, I've really criticized technocratic action plans to end poverty. So then, of course, the next question is, what is my own technocratic action plan to end poverty? And so I thought I would give it to you. Here it is. This is the action plan that, this is the action plan. There's nothing more coming. This is the action plan. So I hope that makes an impression on you. One expert refuses to give an action plan. Why would I refuse? Uh, one, one thing that, we could, that I could point out is that actually we already have quite a large surplus of action plans. A lot of them are sitting on shelves, unread. This has actually been documented by the World Bank's own researchers. The World Bank thinks of itself as the knowledge bank that comes up with all these action plans. Uh, a recent study by a couple of World Bank authors found that 31% of the World Bank's knowledge products, quote, quote, have never been downloaded. Eighty-seven percent were never cited. Never cited means basically nobody ever read them. So even the ones that were downloaded, there was some good intentions by downloading them, but they were never actually read. The history of progress on rights suggests another force that may be, uh, may be a candidate to consider as an alternative to action plans, and that's simply advocacy. How do we make progress on rights? There's a, actually a long history of advocacy of moral norms, caring about the things that we're not supposed to care about in the technocratic worldview. Advocates made progress by asserting that slavery was wrong, by asserting that colonialism was wrong, by asserting that government violations of human rights like happened in Mubenda, Uganda was wrong, that segregation was wrong, that racism is wrong, Martin Luther King Jr.'s most famous speech was called, I Have a Dream. It did not go down in history as, I have an action plan. <laughs> so, so far this has been somewhat of a gloomy story, but I wanna, in this, the final part of the talk, give you some good news. Despite the sad history of aid and development people not caring, about the rights of poor people. There is another group of, of people that do care about the rights of poor people, and that is poor people. Poor people fighting for their own rights have much more patience and resolve than us outside sympathizers do, and they've made a lot of progress already, including in Africa. There's a new book called Africa Uprising, which documents more than 90 political protests in 40 African countries in the past decade. And as a result of this, freedom is making gradual progress in Africa. In 1988, there were far more dictators than there were Democrats in Africa. 
Uh, in 2012, there are still more dictators than Democrats, but the numbers are getting better. The trends are in the right direction. We've gone from only, uh, we've gone from 31 dictators to 19, if you want the exact numbers. We've gone from only two democracies in 1988 to uh, 12. And just if you've been following the news, just over the last few days, Burkina Faso had a democratic election for the first time after decades of dictatorship. So that happened even after I made up this, this talk as a new piece of evidence that freedom is advancing. Economic freedom, which people mistakenly think is something for rich people, but actually as the Mubende and the Ethiopia stories illustrate, the group of people that is really most vulnerable to having their property rights devalued, property rights ignored, are poor people. And economic freedom that measures things like the freedom of people to choose their own economic activities and their property rights is something that has also been advancing recently. This is a chart that shows uh, 1980 uh, the worst economic freedom, that is the most repression of property rights and free freedom of choice in, in economic activities. Uh, and that group is shown in red. The yellow group is in the middle. And the blue is the group that in 1980 were in the top 10%. So that, that's the benchmark of the, the score that is given by a, an independent rating agency on economic freedom to the countries that were in the top 10% in 1980. That same benchmark today applies to almost 50% of the world's countries. So economic freedom is also advancing across the globe, meaning that poor people are, have Instead of cocoa farmers, as used to happen in Ghana, being expropriated by governments that forced them to sell at a low price to the state, and then it was resold at a vastly higher price on world markets, that those cocoa farmers in Ghana have since then gotten, that's gotten their freedom to sell at something close to the world price. That's something that's embodied in a chart like this. So that means real, real new opportunities for choices, new opportunities to consent for poor people in both the political sphere and the economic sphere. And of course, going with that, we've had, uh, in Africa specifically, we've had the best economic growth in Africa in Africa's history of, since independence, in Africa's history, probably in Africa's history ever, over the, since the, the mid-90s. Africa has had very healthy economic growth. And just to give you one specific hopeful sign of that, there are now, today, twice as many cell phone subscribers in Africa as there are in, in my home country, the United States. And this is not just uh, teenagers talking to their girlfriends or boyfriends, this is farmers who are now able to find out what prices are, where they can get the best price. This is uh, traders being able to know when uh, supplies are available for them to buy and sell to feed hungry people. These uh, cell phones are being used to make financial transfers, to make uh, small banking loans. Uh, these cell phones are themselves the creation of a, a generation of remarkable African entrepreneurs, starting with uh, one named Alu Conte, who in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, even in the middle of civil war, was creating cell phone towers on trees, stringing up the transmitters on the tops of trees and using welding together scrap metal to make cell phone towers. And so in the midst of everything, the creativity and entrepreneurship of the African people themselves has created this remarkable success story. Now, of course, there's still too much poverty, uh, but the trends are in the right direction, that the fastest progress against poverty is being made precisely because of the advance in political and economic freedom around the world. So the same rights that were violated in Mubende, Uganda, and in the villagization program in Ethiopia are today being respected much more and are paying off much more. If you really insist on answering that, on having me answer that question, what should we do to end poverty? Of course, that, that we in that question was always part of the problem, it was the assumption that we, the paternalistic, Western, condescending, pitying outsiders were gonna be the source of the solutions, and frankly, we're not as much as part of the solution as we think we are. Maybe we can be a little part of the solution. 
Uh, that was the first problem with that question. And the second problem with that question is we should be focusing on what, first of all, what we ourselves might be doing that's making the rights for the poor worse in poor countries. That includes, uh, first of all, dismissing the technocratic illusion, having those of us who work in aid and development drop the pretense of value-free analysis, of politics-free analysis, and openly join the battle of ideas on the side of freedom against dictatorship and advocate for the cause of freedom for the world's poor. It also includes convincing our own fellow voters in the US and UK that our own aid agencies should not violate the rights of the poor. Our own foreign policy should not violate the rights of the poor. Our own military should not violate the rights of the poor. We ourselves should look at ourselves if we are complicit in violating the rights of the poor. Freedom may be winning, but we know the battle is far from over. So it remains to all of us tonight to keep fighting for those ideals of freedom, for universal freedom for all, to convince many more that all people everywhere Women and men, black and white, rich and poor, indeed deserve to be free at last. Thank you very much.